thousands of ancient spears, scrapers, and butchering tools attributed to the Neanderthals have been excavated. The ancient peoples used what many have described as a super glue to attach stone points and blades to wooden shafts or handles. The freeze-dried, mummified body of the Iceman Otzi was also found with an axe whose refined and processed coppered, copper head had been glued onto the wooden handle with this ancient superglue. The Romans also manufactured and used this superglue for various jobs, including the repair of pottery. The Jewish tradition holds that this superglue is the pitch that Noah used in the construction of his enormous ark. The ancient Egyptians actually had people who specialized in adhesives. They actually had tradesmen whose trade was making various glues. This ancient superglue was one of the many they had in their arsenal. In this science short, we're going to make some of this ancient superglue. The super glue in question is birch bark resin. I realize there are some watching this who won't even know what a birch tree is, so here's what they look like. It's got a strange paper-like bark that's typically white or silver and colored and comes off in sheets like paper. The first step is to harvest a bunch of this birch bark, but bear in mind, removing the bark from a living tree will probably kill it, so you don't want to do that. You could look for a deadfall birch tree and harvest the bark from that trunk. In my case, I simply collected the birch bark from my firewood logs. The process for making the super glue is fairly simple, but some parts produce some really bad odors that'll make your family outhouse smell like a flower shop and some of the oil produced is extremely volatile and flammable. So, you're going to want to do this outside, wear some gloves, put on some of your hand-me-down clothes, and wear your safety sandals, and have your mother on standby. What you need to do is bake the bark at very high temperatures, at least 650 degrees Fahrenheit or 340 degrees Celsius. It needs to be baked in an anoxic environment. In other words, keep oxygen away from it. Otherwise, it'll just catch fire and burn at that temperature. While you can just stick the bark in a sealed heat resistant container and extract the birch oil that way, it's better if you have the oil funnel out of the container and into another catch container. I'll be using these metal tins that I got at the dollar store, but if you really want to stick to the ancient ways, you can use pottery or clay vessels. First thing I do is take the big tin and use a nail or a spike or a screwdriver to puncture the bottom center of the tin. This does two things. It makes a drain hole and it slightly bends the bottom of the tin downward, making a shallow funnel shape so that any oils produced will get funneled into the hole. Next, I'm going to stuff this tin with as much birch bark as possible, making an almost perpetual roll of bark inside the container so that all the bark is vertical. This way, the oils that are shed will drip off of the bark down to the bottom of the container and funneled through the hole in the bottom. Once I've got it stuffed, I'll slap on the lid and this keeps out the oxygen. To set up for the baking, you can dig a hole in the ground for your smaller catch tin, or you can do like I did here and build up earth around the tin. I kept the lid on the tin while I did this, strictly to keep dirt out of the catch tin. Build up a flat area up to the top of the tin, as this is where you will set your birch bark tin and where you will build your fire. I now line up the birch bark tin so that the drip hole is over top of the catch tin. This will keep oxygen out of the catch tin as well. Now build a fire around and on top of your birch bark tin. I burned it hot for close to an hour. The first time I did this, I think I only kept the fire going for a half hour or 45 minutes. But basically, by doing this method, you can't really overheat it. The birch oil will drip down into the catch tin, which is being protected from overheating as the tin is basically buried.
Once it's burned down, you can remove any ashes or wood from around the tin, so none of it falls into the catch tin when you remove the larger tin. Carefully remove the larger tin, use gloves if it's still hot, lifting straight up first to keep contamination in the catch tin to a minimum. Oh look, there's our precious birch oil inside the catch tin. Get the lid back on that tin ASAP to keep out contaminants. You can open up the birch bark tin to see what remains of all the birch bark. There's not much left, it's a very efficient process actually. So now, carefully remove your catch tin from the earthen mound, being especially careful to not get any contaminants in the oil if you didn't put the lid on the tin. This stuff reeks! Effectively, you've produced a form of crude oil. And just like crude oil, it stinks, and it stains, and it contains a whole pile of highly flammable volatiles. Uh, maybe in a later science short, we'll build a mini refinery and try to extract some fuel from the crude oil and maybe run a gas engine off the fuel. For this present science short, we need to refine this oil and we'll do that by simply boiling off the volatiles. Keep that lid handy as you're most likely going to need it to snuff out some fires in the can. So I get my fire going again and I've got a pair of pliers to hold the tin over the flames. Heat up the oil and the volatiles will evaporate. It'll probably catch fire several times. After all, it's like you're boiling gasoline over an open flame. That's just not a wise thing to do on a good day, but this is for science. If it catches fire, just remove the tin from the heat and cover it with the lid to snuff out the fire. But whatever you do, don't get that oil on yourself. It would be like pouring gasoline all over yourself while playing with open fire. Not to mention it'll give you and your clothes a bad case of perma stink. All around, not a good idea. As you boil off more and more volatiles, it will become less and less flammable and thicker. Keep heating it, take your time at it, and take the time to boil off as much of it as you can. Eventually, you'll be left with a very thick tar which actually has some unusual properties. What you are left with doesn't stink anymore. In fact, some ancient peoples decided to use this stuff as chewing gum. You can store it on a stick if you just take the stick and scoop up and coat the stick with all of the tar from in there. As it cools off, it makes a sort of soft plastic. Simply heat it up again to use it. The word gopher wood used in the Bible to describe the construction of Noah's Ark isn't describing a tree or wood, but rather a wood process. It's a process of cross-lamination of layers of wood, effectively making plywood. This birch resin is especially useful with wood. You can see here I've just got some popsicle sticks that I glued together. When I pour out the hot birch resin onto the wooden sticks, watch closely. The resin soaks right into the wood. It isn't just a superficial glue, but rather absorbs into the wood as well as to glue the pieces together. Keep it all as hot as you can keep it. Apply the glue to all the sticks and you can see I build it up in that crosshatch pattern to make a thick plywood and then let it cool. Voila, you have gopher wood. You can also try gluing a stone spear point to a stick using this resin. You'll probably want to get the stone at least warm, if not fairly hot, before you try to apply the resin. The Neanderthals peoples evidently mixed in other materials with the resin. Uh, fine sand and iron oxide, or rust, which was probably just pulverized red rocks. But they very evenly mixed it in with the resin, so it was obviously deliberate and done while the resin was kept hot to work it. 
This changed the chemistry of the resin and probably makes the resin bind better with stone. It also probably acts as a bit of a filler. You can experiment mixing in fine sand or even ashes from your fire as there were some archaeological findings that seem to indicate the glue makers deliberately mixed wood ash into the resin. If you enjoyed this science short, do check out the other science shorts on the Tech Valley Science Center's channel where we explore all things science and tech, from electricity and electronics to physics, even to paleontology and archaeology. And of course, you know what's coming. Like and subscribe. <laughs> Thanks for watching and let me know in the comments if you made this ancient super glue, what you did with it, and how it turned out for you.